Good morning, everyone. It is so great to see you all here today. We have a great number here with us. I know we have visitors who are with us as well. Thank you so much. If you have any Bible questions, we'd always love to study the Word of God with you. We're going to beginning or begin our study here in just a moment in Romans chapter 3, if you'd like to go ahead and turn over there. And while you're turning over there, I think it's always good to remind us as we move into the month of February of the great things that are taking place here at West Main. You know, we have our memory verses that our young people are uh, quoting or, or, or saying to someone here at the congregation each Sunday uh, from the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 was from the month of January. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And for this month, the month of February, is Matthew 5 and verse number 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I was sitting over there just a few minutes ago. And I thought about the Wednesday class that I taught on behalf of Zach via Zoom. And I used his slides, and there was a text or a slide that had Matthew 5 and verse 4. And I thought, I wonder what that there, I wonder why is, why, why is that slide there? And it finally came to me. It's the memory verse that I didn't even quote uh, during the Zoom. Sorry about that, Zach. So it just finally dawned on me. That's our memory verse for the month, Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 4. Uh, we have something else taking place for the young people as well, and that's our Bible drill. That's going to be taking place after services uh, for our young people, so you're welcome to be a part of that. And then beginning tonight, one of our elders is going to be leading a special study at 5 p.m. here at the building, Stephen Estes, post-marital counseling from God. Uh, so he's going to be talking about the scriptures and about marriage and our relationships, and so we're looking forward to that. What a great opportunity for couples, uh, for husbands and wives to come back together to study something very important as we consider the family. And I'll just say this to all of the men here, Valentine's is next week, all right? So don't forget, okay? Happy wife is a happy life. All right, there you go. It's always a blessing to be able to worship God, and it's a blessing to know that our Father in heaven, he truly sees us. He knows who we are. And that should give us great comfort. I, I think about Hagar in Genesis chapter 16, when Hagar was sent away, and there was this interaction that occurred, and she said in verse number 13, Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God who sees. Adonai Elroy, you are a God who sees. For she said, I, Have I seen, have I even remained alive after seeing him? It's a blessing to know that our Father in heaven, he sees us. He knows who you are, and he knows what you're going through, and he knows what I am going through as well. Our theme for this year, and this is something else that's really great that's taken place here at West Main, is the title that you see behind us, or behind me on the slide, Freed from Sin, Servants to God. That's a, a statement that's, that Paul mentioned in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 22. And as you think about God and the God who sees, I'm thankful that our Father in heaven saw just how desperate and lost we were, and yet he would send his son for us. And our thoughts this morning are going to begin in Romans chapter 3. As we think about this theme, each first Sunday of each month, we'll be talking about something from this theme, freed from sin, servants to God. In Romans chapter 3 and verse number 21, as Paul laid out the argument or laid out the problem for men, which is sin, and how we can be right with God. Notice what Paul says in verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Notice what he says in verse 25. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. When I think about Romans chapter 3 and verse number 25, there's a word that has often caught my attention, and maybe it has caught your attention as well, and that is the word propitiation. It's a word that we don't often use that much. And this morning, I want to talk about this word propitiation. 
It can be hard to pronounce. It can be even more challenging sometimes to spell. But what does it mean? And how is it used? It's found in the New Testament, as we see here. I'm reading from the New American Translation. Paul, or Paul speaks about Jesus and the fact that God, in verse 25, displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This idea of propitiation will certainly help us, I believe, to better appreciate and to love God to view sin even more as it really is, as something that we should always stay away from. And it should help us even in our relationships with one another. So let's talk a little bit about this word, propitiation. The English word propitiation is from Latin, meaning favorable or gracious and kind, or render favorable. And the first attested use of this term is in a Latin translation of the Scriptures. The Latin form propititorium was employed to translate the Greek word hilasterion, which is found 22 times in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now, what's interesting about this word that when it was used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, it was used to translate the Hebrew term covering or mercy seat which was the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. We read about that in Leviticus chapter 16, which was the lid of the Ark of the Covenant where the sacrificial blood was placed for the atonement of the sins of the people in the Old Testament. Now, the background of this word in Greek is also interesting, and it's important to understand some distinctions that need to be made as well. These words were used as a sacrifice that one bought to appease the anger of the gods. And the individual who would bring this sacrifice to appease the anger of the gods chanced that the attitude of the god or the gods might be altered, hoping the gods would be disposed to look upon the person with favor from which further blessings might flow. Now, as we think about this word propitiation, we need to make sure we understand a couple of distinctions. Number one, when you look at Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8, when we consider how this word or this idea or concept may have been used during the days of the Greeks then, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, first of all, a distinction needs to be made about the true and living God. That the true and living God is indeed He is love. In Romans 5 and verse 8, the Bible says, but God demonstrates His own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. So a clear distinction between these false gods, these idol gods, is that the true and living God of the Bible that we serve and worship, indeed, He is a God of love. And yet, it is also important to understand that God can also be angry and is angry with man when it comes to sin. In fact, we read about this in the book of Romans as well. And we'll come back to this text. Remember in Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2 and verse number 1, Paul said, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself for who, for you who judges, practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Listen to what he says next. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. God is love. God is holy. God is just and righteous. And yet there is coming a day of wrath for those who are disobedient to God. And so that's going to be an important concept as well as we consider this idea of propitiation. And a distinction should be made between the false gods of those days of, of Greek and in Roman times and the true and living God. Propitiation will help us to see and understand how God's anger or wrath would be appeased when it comes to sin. And so if we are to make some definitions or really lay this out about what this word means, here are a couple of definitions for us. 
Number one, we could say that propitiation is a gift that turns away wrath. Propitiation is a gift that turns away wrath. We could also say this. It's a gift that appeases one's anger. And maybe we could also say that it's like a go-between. Those first two thoughts are really like more. A gift that turns away wrath, a gift that appeases one's anger. And I want to share with you a couple of Old Testament stories where I think we'll see this in action. It may not be exactly parallel to God and us when it comes to our sin, but I think this will help us to understand more of this idea of propitiation and what it actually looks like in action. So the first example that I want to share with you, let's go to the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 32, remember the two men, the two boys, Jacob and Esau. Now, we're not going to read the entire story, but look over in Genesis chapter 32. We know that Jacob was a, uh, he was a trickster, and we know that he would deceive his father, uh, Isaac, in Genesis. Genesis chapter 32 and take away the birthright of of uh, of his son or of his brother Esau and as a result of that numerous years had passed and if you remember what happened after that took place Esau wanted to kill his brother remember that he wanted to kill uh, Jacob and so now there's this time where eventually they are now going to be reunited with one another and so naturally there is some fear that Jacob has toward Esau Rightfully so, because he had had done him wrong and he had deceived his father and took a blessing from him. And so in Genesis chapter 32, I want you to pick up in verse 13. What we find here is that prior to this meeting, Jacob is going to get all of his people and his livestock and his riches lined up. And watch what he does here. And this story is used to help us to understand a little bit more about this idea of propitiation. Verse 13. So he spent the night there. Then he selected from what he had with him a present for his brother Esau. So he's going to bring or he's presenting or putting together these presents for Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 20 or 200 ewes and 200 rams, 30 milking camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by itself. And said to his servants, pass on before me and put a space between droves. He commanded the one in front saying, when you, when my brother Esau meets you and asks you saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going and to whom do these animals in front of you belong? Then you shall say, these belong to your servant Jacob. Now watch what he says. It is a present sent to my Lord Esau. So Jacob had put together a gift or presents to send beforehand to his brother Esau. In verse number 19, he says, Then he commanded also the second and the third, and all those who followed the drove, saying, After this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And you shall say, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, listen to this, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. Then afterward, I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So you see what Jacob did. He put together these gifts on behalf of Esau because he knew that they had not been reconciled. Their relationship was not right. He knew that Esau justifiably had this anger towards him. And so he would give him these gifts to appease the anger of Esau so that their relationship might be right again. And so when I read this example here, I think this is a great example of this idea of propitiation in action. There are some other things for us to think about, but that's one example there. What about 1 Samuel chapter 25? Look over in 1 Samuel chapter 25 where we read the story of Nabal, Abigail, and King David. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, remember Nabal was such a foolish man, and Abigail was such a wise woman. And this interaction between Nabal and David and his men in verse number 23, and again, I'm going to show this to you because I think this helps to understand a little bit more of this idea of propitiation, of appeasing one's uh, anger, or a gift that appeases one's anger, or takes away that anger. 
In 1 Samuel chapter 25 and verse 23, the Bible says, When Abigail saw David, she hurried and dismounted from her donkey and fell on her face before David and bowed herself to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, Oh, on me alone, my Lord, be the blame. And please let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. Please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Verse 26, Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be as Nabal. Now let this gift which your maidservant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who accompany my Lord. Listen to what she said. Verse 27, what is she doing? She's presenting a gift. She's presenting a gift. And then listen to what she says in verse 28. Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant. For the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house. Because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. And evil will not be found in you all of your days. So Abigail presents this gift. She's seeking this forgiveness from David and to appease his anger, which was justified in the manner in which Nabal had treated him. Now listen to what David said in verse number 32. Then David said to Abigail, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed be your discernment and blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself. By my own hand. So you have this gift which appeased David and took away this wrath that David had. And so I think these two examples here give us a, a, a good picture, at least, or concept of this idea of propitiation and how the New Testament speaks about Jesus being our or being the propitiation for our sins. So let's go to the New Testament now. Let's see the four passages and what we can learn even more about this idea of propitiation. So there are four places that we can find this word in the New Testament. And again, I'm reading from the New American translation. Some translations may even use the word atonement, uh, which also gives us some indication of what this word is helping us to understand. Let's read Romans 3 and verse 25 again. Let's read all four of these passages together in Romans 3 and verse 25 and see what else you might be able to pick up. Whom God displayed publicly, talking about Jesus, as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins of previously committed now look over in hebrews chapter 2 hebrews chapter 2 verse number 17 the hebrew writer as he spoke about jesus and what he had done and how he came to this world notice what he said here he said in hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17 therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in all things or in things pertaining to god Listen to what he says here. To make propitiation for the sins of the people. Look at 1 John. In 1 John chapter 2. And we can just pick it up in verse number 1. 1 John chapter 2. And we can pick it up here in verse number 1. 1 John 2 and verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Now look at chapter 4, and let's look at verses 9 and 10. And First John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Notice what John says here in chapter 4 and verses 9 and 10. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins.
thoughts that we need to consider next. Number one, as we think about this idea of propitiation and this gift to appease one's wrath, we're obviously talking about sin and God and us. And first, we need to talk about the source. The source of this propitiation is God. And that's something very powerful that we should not overlook. Abigail provided a gift for David. And Jacob provided a gift for Esau. Gift can we ever provide to God when it comes to appeasing his wrath and his anger towards us? So as you think about this idea of propitiation, the source of this propitiation is God. God initiates the propitiation, and that's why Romans chapter 5 is so important. When Paul, notice again what he says in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8. Romans 5 and verse number 8, Paul said, actually go back to verse number 6. He says, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. So as we think about propitiation, we need to be thinking about God's love. What we always need to remember is the love of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So like the stories we've read, God provided the gift for us to appease his anger toward us. And his anger, sometimes people think, well, God doesn't get angry. Well, yes, he does. The Bible speaks a great deal about his wrath and his anger. God is holy. And when it comes to sin, God cannot tolerate sin. And yet what we find here is that he is the source. He is the one that initiates the propitiation, that provided the sacrifice, his son, Jesus, as the gift to appease his anger toward us. And that, my friend, is awesome. And that's why, John, when you go back to 1 John chapter 4, again, remember what John said in 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 10. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 10, he said, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son. How do we know God loved us? Because he sent his son to die for us when we were still helpless, lost, enemies of him. And so the source of this propitiation is Jesus Christ. And that's a clear distinction between what men may have done with towards the pagan gods and those other examples that I shared with you. As we think about the source, we have to also talk about the sin or the sins. In all four of these passages, sin is mentioned. And so this helps us to understand some more about propitiation. We learn that propitiation has to do with our sins. Jesus came to make propitiation for our sins. He came to be this sacrifice or this gift to appease God's wrath, uh, to, to, to pay this price that we could not pay. Hebrews chapter 2, one of the passages we just read, emphasizes this again. He said, therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Sin separates us from God. When we are lost in our sins, we do not have that favor with God. But now because of this sacrifice, we can now be restored with our Father in heaven. And so this is important as well as we consider the problem of sin. Paul said in Ephesians 2 and verse 1, When you were dead in your trespasses and sin. The Bible speaks a great deal about sin. In fact, Paul speaks a great deal about sin. Our theme is freed from sin which helps us to see that sin shackles and holds us captive. And there's nothing good about it. And yet now because of Jesus, who is the propitiation for our sins, we now are freed or delivered from sin. Paul will remind us, though, of the problem of sin. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And those lost in sin will suffer the wrath of God. So how does the wrath of God, how can that ever be appeased or satisfied? What gift could we ever give God? Well, we can't. That's why Jesus would have to come here on earth. And so as you think about the sins, this is a reminder that sin is truly ugly. 
This is a reminder that Esau, or Jacob, when Jacob deceived his father and, and took what belonged to Esau, well, he hurt Esau. He hurt him. When someone does us wrong, we hurt them. And all of us at some point in time, I'm sure, have been wronged, have been hurt. But do we ever think about that idea from God's perspective? We, when we sin, who does that hurt? It hurts God. And God is holy and he is perfect and righteous and good. And if we don't really wrap our minds around sin, then we're not truly going to appreciate propitiation. If we don't understand how ugly sin really is, and that's why sin is never anything to play with or to take lightly. Because God sent his son into the world to be the propitiation for our sins. And that leads us to the sacrifice. Some kind of sacrifice had to be given. There was this shedding of blood that had to take place. He was that go-between so that we might be reconciled to God. And so this should help us as well as we understand the sacrifice of Jesus and what he truly endured. Go back to 1 John chapter 2 again. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 2, John is writing to Christians. These are individuals who have already been saved by, by the blood of Jesus Christ. But this sacrifice had to take place. Why did Jesus have to die? Well, to appease God's wrath. To be that gift or that sacrifice, to pay the price, to pay the debt that we could never pay back to God. To be reconciled, to be made right with God. And that's why in 1 John chapter 2, what a beautiful thought here. Very similar to John 3 and verse 16. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So the problem with sin is for everyone. This is a problem that we all have. The whole world. And so he died, or he became that sacrifice, this gift, so that we could be made right with God. And that is the sacrifice we should never take for granted. You think about the source. The source of the propitiation for our sins is God. And the sin that we need to consider, uh, our sin, is something that we should never overlook. And the sacrifice is Jesus. And now think about the salvation. Through this gift, through this sacrifice, one can be made right right with God one can be forgiven of their sins one can have their sins washed away because of Christ and what was accomplished in his death and that takes us back to our theme in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 7 for he who has died is freed from sin we can be freed from sin but only through Jesus Christ and something I think that it's always important to say here is that Jesus was the propitiation for the whole world. But in order to receive this free gift of salvation, to be freed from our sins, well, we have to follow the pattern that's been given to us in the New Testament. And I love how Paul says in verse number 17, But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. If you want to be freed from sin and be reconciled to your God and to have peace with your Father in heaven and to know that all your past sins have been forgiven, well, you have to do what Paul says here in verse 17. This is what Christians did in the first century. They were obedient from the heart to that form of teaching or this pattern of teaching to which you were committed. You remember back in Acts chapter 18, we turn over there in Acts chapter 18. Remember when Paul was in Corinth? You see this pattern of what he taught those in Corinth for 18 months. In Acts chapter 18 and verse number 8, the Bible says, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all of his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And that's the pattern that we have to follow. We have to believe in Jesus and who he is and the fact that he's risen from the grave and that he is the son of God. Remember Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 22. In Acts chapter 22, when Paul was stopped on the road to Damascus and he saw the Lord in heaven and he was blinded for a period of three days and three nights, I believe. 
And Ananias would come to him in Acts chapter 22. And he would say this to Paul in verse number 16. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. You see, Paul obeyed the same pattern or form of teaching that he taught to others as well. And this is what we find in the book of Romans. Now, I think it's always important sometimes if you go to, I don't know, maybe different doctor's offices or places of business, you can see some pamphlets that have been left out by someone. And they often have something called the Roman road to salvation. Have you heard something like that? The Roman road to salvation, where they list certain passages. And these roads are found in the book of Romans. One of those roads is Romans 3 and verse 23, that all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. Another one of those roads is Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. This is one of the passages that they quote as well in, in some of these pamphlets where they say in verse number 10, or chapter 10 and verse number 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, that is book, chapter, and verse right there. I believe that to be true, and we should believe that to be true as well. Another road is verse 10, where they say, For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. That's part of this Roman road as well. But strangely, sadly, they leave out a very important road. Chapter 6. And when you go back to Romans chapter 6, you can't dismiss this road when it comes to salvation. Paul would say, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How should we who die to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. If one is going to be saved from their sins, yes, they must believe Jesus is this Christ, the Son of God. Yes, they must confess their faith in who Jesus is. Yes, they must repent of their sins. And yes, they must be buried in water and baptism for the forgiveness of their sins. You see, this is how when we are raised, we walk in newness of life. This is how, according to verse 5, we are united with him. And this is when, according to verse number 7, we are freed from sin. And it's because of the sacrifice of Jesus that we have this opportunity to receive this free gift of God that we could never repay. We could never give anything to God. But God is so good that he provided the sacrifice or the gift for us to appease his anger. And Jesus was the willing sacrifice who died on the cross for you and for me. So how should this impact us? How do we respond to this? What is the so what? If you're still taking notes and still following along. Well, this concept of propitiation should cause us to rejoice. And it should really affect us in many ways. How we view God, how we view our lives, how we view one another. Consider 1 John 4 and verse 10 again. Let me give you a few points to take home. Number one, the idea of propitiation, well, it's reason for us to love one another. In 1 John chapter 4, we've already read verse 9 and 10 a few times. When you go back to verse 9 and 10, let's add verse 11 now. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. God has been merciful to mankind by sending his son. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now watch what he says next. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. How will people know that we are truly his disciples? It will be by the love that we have for one another. And so when you think about this sacrifice, this gift, it should have immediate impact in your life today with how you view your brothers and sisters in Christ, how you view 
the people of God. And I'll say this as well. Of this closeness that we have with one another and th we should have this is reason for us to share the gospel I, I could preach a sermon every month for the entire year on evangelism but there still I think has to be something even deeper inside of us we don't need any more tactics or tools we, we have we have the cards out in the foyer we have books we have plenty of classes but understanding what Christ has done and understanding how much God truly loves men and women that's reason for us to share our faith. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jesus Christ was a propitiation not just for our sins, but for the sin of the whole world, which means that we need to go into all the world. And that world we can start in our house. We can start in our neighborhoods. We can start in our jobs. We can start where we are. That's reason for us to talk, to share, to invite when it comes to Jesus Christ. And it's reason for us to trust in God and His Son. In Hebrews chapter 2, remember in verse 17, I love this here, came to earth. And he is the one that can tell us, I know what you're going through. He lived here. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17, Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus is faithful, which means that we can always trust him. He always does what he says he will do. And that's reason, no matter what we are up against, to know that our Savior is with us. He's faithful, and so is his Father in heaven. That's reason for us to trust in God and in his Son. And I'll say this as well. Go back to 1 John chapter 2, and verse, verses 1 and 2. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, as we understand this idea of propitiation, it's a reason for us to sin no more stop period end of discussion the woman caught in adultery what did Jesus tell her sin no more God loved us so much he sent his son to be this gift or this sacrifice to appease his wrath toward us because of our sins. And in 1 John chapter 2, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Don't sin. But here's the good news. Even after we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we still fall short. And the good news is that the blood of Jesus continues to work on our behalf. If we confess our sins to him, according to chapter 1, he's faithful to forgive us. And John will go on and say, And if anyone sins, we have an advocate, a, a paraclete, one who is like an intercessor with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. See, that's reason for us not to sin. Because Jesus had to come to deliver us from sin. And it's reason for us to keep his commandments. Look at what he says in verse 3. By this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments. The one who says I have come to know him. And does not keep his commandments. Is a liar. And the truth is not in him. That is reason for us. To take up our crosses daily. And to follow Jesus. Why? Because we have been freed from sin. And we're now servants or slaves to God. 
over and over in the Gospels. Jesus said, follow me. And because he is the propitiation for our sins, the most obvious, easiest answer should always be, yes, I will follow you. Not my will, but yours. That's the impact. We consider this idea of propitiation, the sacrifice, and the blood that Jesus shed on our behalf. If you're not a child of God, today's a great day for you to take up your cross and to follow him. Today's a great day for you to follow the form of teaching which has been delivered. Today is a good day for you to consider how good your God in heaven is for the problem of sin and that there's nothing good that will happen if you die lost in your sin. Dan Fontenot said some great words about death. What a blessing it will be for those who die in the Lord. What a sad day it will be for those who die outside of Jesus Christ. Our God in heaven, indeed, he is merciful. And he is willing to allow you to be redeemed if you're willing to believe in his son Jesus, to turn from your sins, and to be buried in baptism for the forgiveness of your sin. If that's you, come forward as we stand and sing.